Indiana News Desk is made possible in part by Smithville, Fiber Internet, Streaming TV, Home Security, and Automation in Southern Indiana. More information at smithville.com. Mallor Grodner Attorneys, providing legal services to clients and the community. Understanding expertise results. Bloomington and Indianapolis, lawmg.com. The IU School of Education, preparing teachers, scholars, and administrators to improve teaching in Indiana and around the world. Education.indiana.edu. IU Alumni Association, connecting IU's network of alumni and sharing the Indiana spirit through scholarships, advocacy, and volunteerism. Alumni.iu.edu. IU Center for Rural Engagement, extending IU Bloomington resources to improve Hoosier lives in partnership with communities and organizations. Rural.indiana.edu. And by WTIU members. Thank you. Coming up on Indiana News Desk. As Hoosiers start casting their ballots in early voting, election security is top of mind. Ahead, what's being done to protect your vote? Nothing goes on the internet. Nothing is out there that that ballot, somebody can interfere with it. And Senate candidates battle it out in the first debate of a contentious race to help set the agenda in Washington. Indiana has a lot of caves to explore, but it can be dangerous if you're not prepared. Anybody going in with proper training for what they're going into and proper equipment and following the very basic caving rules, it creating the caving is incredibly safe. Those stories plus the latest news headlines from across the state right now on Indiana News Desk. Welcome to Indiana News Desk, I'm Joe Wren. Well, as part of our Inquire Indiana series, we want to hear your questions about the Hoosier State, then we'll work to find the answers. And we got a couple of questions about security during the upcoming election. Gregory Carmack from Culver wants to know if Hoosiers have the right to ask for a paper ballot. He says he's concerned about election hacking. And Lucy Gerlach from Bloomington asked, which Indiana counties do not have paper ballots? Barbara Brozier tracked down the answers. Whether Hoosiers have access to paper ballots depends on where they live. About two-thirds of Indiana's counties only offer electronic voting on Election Day. The remaining counties offer optical scan ballots, or paper ballots, that people fill out and a machine tallies. Let's take a closer look at how that works in Monroe County. Monroe County election officials spent months preparing for this week. We have workers getting out ballots to go out to people who have requested an absentee ballot by mail. So those ballots are being sent out in the mail every day. Even before early voting started on Wednesday, Election Central fielded a lot of calls from people with concerns. People really want to know that their ballot is secure. And I can safely tell you that Monroe County is doing everything possible to make sure that their, their integrity of their ballot is being taken very seriously. There are several steps the county takes to safeguard its election process. Monroe County voters use paper ballots. Those who vote early won't have their ballots counted until Election Day. Until then, they're kept behind this locked door. Anytime we handle a ballot in this office, it's always by a bipartisan team. No one takes a ballot and even walks across the room without having another person of, a, of the other party with them. So that ballot is never alone with anyone. When people vote on November 6th, they'll insert their ballots into a machine that will tabulate the results. And that information is stored several ways. The data goes on to the data card. The data is, is housed in the machine until we clear it after the election. And then we also have the ballots we can go back to. That leads to other concerns about hacking. But the voting machines aren't connected to the internet, which makes that hard to do. And the data cards would show evidence of interference if someone tried to manipulate them. The National Academies of Science, Engineering and Medicine recently released a report that recommends all states use paper ballot machines by 2020 because that ensures there's always a paper trail. Indiana's Secretary of State says it's something her office is working on. So we'll be talking to the General Assembly and our counties and our vendors about making sure that Indiana can, can provide that. But it won't be in 2018, but we feel very confident on our machines and our equipment that we're using. In the meantime, only Hoosiers living in counties that use paper ballots 
can vote the old-fashioned way. Just requesting a paper because you wanted to vote on paper, I think it's important for people to remember that we've had more problems reading paper ballots in the way the in voter intended to vote than we've ever had on any machine that we use here in the state of Indiana. You can find out your voting status by going to indianavoters.com. In addition to telling you whether you're registered to vote, it will also list your polling location and the candidates that are on the ballot. Well, we want to explore the questions you have about Indiana, and you could even be part of the process as we find the answers. Just go to wtiu.org slash inquireindiana to submit your questions. Well, the candidates for Indiana's Senate seat wasted no time this week in attacking each other during their first debate. They sparred over health care, tax reform, and support for President Donald Trump. If President Trump put up Bugs Bunny, Mike would have said he should go on the court. Republican candidate Mike Braun hit back plenty as he continued his effort to label Democratic incumbent Joe Donnelly as someone who doesn't keep his promises. Considered the least effective Democratic senator because he never sticks his neck out. He blows with the wind. And Libertarian Lucy Brenton sought to carve out a path as the race's only true outsider. This is really about the old parties, whether they wear a red jacket or a blue jacket trying to force and make you do something that may not be in your own best interests. The second and final debate is scheduled for October 30th. Well, more questions about climate change came in for this week's Senate debate than any other topic. Our energy and environment reporter Rebecca Thiel joins us. Rebecca, why do you think climate change is such a big issue for Hoosiers right now? Well, it's hard to say, Joe, but this was the first debate between the candidates, and so it's not a surprise that these national issues came up, like the Affordable Care Act, like tax reform. Uh, medical marijuana and med marijuana legalization are often popular as well, but climate change was still more popular. Now, what are some of the topics that Hoosiers wanted to know about, more in specific? So it was really a lot of general stuff. They really wanted to know what the candidates would do to address climate change. But there were a few who wanted to know whether they'd be in favor of a carbon tax. So uh, that's, of course, a tax on fossil fuels that would make corporations uh, be a little bit more responsible for their greenhouse gas emissions. You know, I know there was a pretty startling report from the United Nations came out just before that debate. Do you think that had any uh, effect on those questions? Surprisingly, only a couple of questions actually mentioned the report. But we know that we're going to have to make huge changes and fast to keep from warming above 1.5 degrees Celsius. And the reason that matters is because that's when we're going to see high risks to human health and the environment. Um, now we would have to be at zero emissions by 2050 and be halfway in about 12 years. They say this is possible, but it's going to take everyone's cooperation in order to make it happen. Uh, that includes government, utilities, and even you, Joe. Yeah, well... Rebecca, thank you very much. We'll be following up on that, I'm sure. Now for headlines, we go over to Alex Eady, who has the latest on this week's top stories. Thanks, Joe. Thanks. Governor Eric Holcomb is declining to comment on allegations of intimidation and adultery leveled at House Speaker Brian Bosma. The accusations from a former House Democratic intern appeared in an Indianapolis Star story over the weekend. Bosma became House Speaker in 2004. The allegations are from 1992. Candy Green says she had a sexual encounter with Bosma and she claims an attorney hired by Bosma this year harassed her friends and family in an effort to intimidate and discredit her. Bosma denies both accusations. Governor Eric Holcomb won't call for any investigation and he says he won't comment without an official report of the allegations. A decades-long debate over whether Indiana should have an explicit hate crimes law is no closer to a resolution. A committee assigned to study the issue decided this week not to issue any recommendations. There may be, you know, obviously a lot of new legislators coming in and how they choose to deal with these issues in their states and what that will look like nationally is something we'll be paying close attention to. The governor says he'll support an effort to pass a hate crimes law in the upcoming legislative session that begins in January. The Catholic Archdiocese of Indianapolis is under fire as 23 priests have been credibly accused of sexual abuse of a minor or young person dating back to the 1940s. The Archdiocese published the names this week. Each of the accused priests who are still alive have been removed from ministry. 
And the U.S. Secretary of Housing and Urban Development, Ben Carson, visited Indiana this week to talk about fair housing policies and laws. Carson was the keynote speaker at a regional housing fair conference, and he said public-private initiatives at the local level are essential to improving public assistance. Complacency is our enemy. And we must recognize that if we're not vigilant, things really begin to move in the opposite direction. Carson made headlines earlier this year with a proposal HUD sent Congress that would change how rent is calculated for adults who can work. In some cases, that would triple rent. He defended that jump, saying today's job climate means the department needs to encourage self-sufficiency. Indiana University researchers have received $300,000 in a grant from the federal Save America's Treasures program. The money will be used to curate and rehouse nearly 3 million artifacts recovered from the Angel Mounds historic site near Evansville. So what we have in these, these boxes are hundreds and thousands, well, thousands of, um, of uh, pieces of pottery, uh, stone tool remains, uh, bone tool remains, all of the, the material culture. This bag um, was collected, uh, is dated uh, November 22nd, 1939, and it's the original, original bag. So what we want to be able to do is to transfer the bulk collections from Angel to that new facility, but we want to do so in, in brand new uh, state-of-the-art housing materials. The site holds a lot of research potential, untapped research potential, and so by being able to rehouse the collections and make them more accessible um, to researchers both here at IU as well as uh, other in, uh, institutions, you know, I just, uh, we, that's such, that's going to be very, very important for, for the archaeology, archaeological community. Wow, Alex, I can't get over it. Over two million artifacts, amazing. Yeah, it's absolutely incredible. Thank you so much, Alex. Coming up next on Indiana News Desk. We go underground with a group of Indiana cavers to see what they do to make caving as safe as possible. And e-cigarettes are growing in popularity, especially among young people. Ahead, how one middle school is trying to prevent kids from using the devices. These stories and more right here on Indiana News Desk. The WTIU WFIU news team connects Indiana to the world. We bring you the top news of the day on radio, TV, and online. We round up the stories that have people talking each week and dig deep into the issues that affect your community the most. The WTIU WFIU News Team is where you are and telling your story. In a time of change, where can you find in-depth reporting and thoughtful analysis? Washington Week on PBS. Join moderator Robert Costa. When I was at the Capitol this week, I encountered the same... And a panel of award-winning journalists. You're seeing a divided nation and you're seeing... For insights and perspective. Tonight there was a key development in the You Senate won't find anywhere else. What a week. Washington Week. Welcome back to Indiana News Desk. Well, this is a Juul. It's a popular e-cigarette brand that comes in flavors such as cotton candy, mango, and cucumber. It's marketed as an alternative to smoking, but each pod has as much nicotine as an entire pack of cigarettes. The FDA is labeling vaping an epidemic among young people. It's a problem schools are fighting with every day. The definition of epidemic is, is too broad. But I think if it impacts one child negatively, that to us is an epidemic in, as a family. You know, so that's one is too many. Classes in Martinsville have been in session only a few weeks, but Boland says he's already confiscated two jewels. Boland says one problem is that the devices are hard to identify. I saw the jewel over the summer, and it did. It looked exactly like a flash drive. And uh, that, would, that would surprise a lot of parents. And uh, that's why they put them and made them like a flash drive. A report this year from the Indiana Youth Institute found 15% of high school students surveyed used electronic vapor products in the past month. Students are always looking to fit in. That is the nature of the beast has been even whenever I was a kid. People wanted to try to fit in. And the peer pressures that uh, are thrust upon them uh, in this day and age is even worse than it was when I was here because of social media. Even though 
they might have more information, they also have more pressure at the same time, and that becomes very difficult to balance. And that is exactly what Andrew Harmon thought when he heard that jewels were becoming popular at the high school. I know kids, they do it over at the high school a lot, and I'm afraid it may start here, and we don't want that to happen. Even though jewels are less toxic than cigarettes, they're not toxin-free and have a lot of nicotine. Harmon proposed an idea. If he produced a video that could be played in the student newscast and put on YouTube, he could explain some of the dangers of jeweling. It was our first skit that we had done for the year, so I said, well, Ms. Zerman, why don't we do a skit about jewels? After he got the go-ahead from his teacher, Harmon put together a group of his classmates. Together, they did research, contacted local law enforcement, and put together their skit. Please stand up. I applaud AJ and his crew uh, for doing it and Mrs. Zimmerman for taking on the task. The unprecedented rescue of a soccer team in a flooded Thailand cave this summer captivated the world. And it led many people to wonder about their own safety. Experts say southern Indiana is one of the best places to cave, and for the most part, it's an extremely safe sport. But as Lindsay Wright reports, it requires preparation. Imagine exploring a cave hundreds of feet below the Earth's surface, and somewhere along the way, your flashlight goes out. You don't have a backup. This is what you'd see. Not much. For many, this would induce panic. That's why Anmar Mirza says it's important to be prepared for any situation when venturing into a cave. If you don't follow good safe caving practices, they can be dangerous. But anybody going in with proper training for what they're going into and proper equipment and following the very basic caving rules, caving is incredibly safe. Mirza is the national coordinator for the National Cave Rescue Commission, and he also manages the property where Buckner Cave sits. These folks are strapping on their knee pads and putting on their helmets as they prepare to crawl through the Bloomington Cave. It's one of thousands of caves that winds through the state, and it's where a group of caving hobbyists meets about once a week. We use that opportunity to kind of see what our weekend visitors have done for the cave, make sure nobody's you know, done any vandalism, but we also use it as a training ground for new people who want to get involved in caving. Mirza says, first, you should never go into a cave alone. And be careful, it gets very slick. Small groups are best. For a safe experience, cavers need some basic equipment. That includes knee pads, loose rugged clothing, shoes with ankle support, adequate amounts of light, and a helmet. A helmet is very important because you're in a very small environment and you're going to hit your head a lot. And uh, my caving helmet actually has some pretty deep grooves in it, which if I hadn't been wearing my helmet, would have probably been a skull fracture. It's difficult to fully understand how important even this basic equipment is until you're in the trenches, so to speak. So we took a trip to Indiana Caverns in Corridan. Inside your cave packs is for your, your snacks, water. We're headed underground for the organization's deep darkness tour. The mental and physical endurance is what sets it apart from other experiences. And you always have someone on the surface who knows where you're going. Even for a deep darkness, we have people on the surface who know when, when we're going and where we're going. This is not a leisurely hike. We descend down a 90-foot ladder, then strap ourselves in to scale a 100-foot slope. From there, Blevins leads the group as we trudge through thigh-high water, paddle across an underground river, and squeeze through tiny openings. She says tours like this one are a good way to get your feet wet with caving, literally. But they also make it abundantly clear why safety should be the first thing on any caver's mind. Blevins knows from experience that a caver has to be prepared for the unexpected. She was part of a group that ended up trapped for nearly 40 hours a couple years ago when the caves unexpectedly flooded. It wasn't just luck that no one ended up hurt. Rescuers got them out, but the group was prepared to wait for help. There wasn't forecast for rain. When we went, we knew what we were doing. We had the proper uh, equipment, food, water. We were all wearing wetsuits. We had the trash bags, the thermal blankets. So there are serious risks when it comes to caving. But Mirza says of the thousands of people who go through Indiana's caves each year, typically only a couple result in rescues. I've had something like 7,000 hours underground in my lifetime, and the worst injuries I've gotten are like a few bumps and bruises. 
And that's because this is what a prepared caver looks like. Someone who's armed with the tools to navigate the unexpected. For Indiana News Desk, I'm Lindsay Wright. Now, Becca Costello went with Lindsay into the cave and she joins us now. Becca, wow, what was that like? Joe, that was one of the hardest things I've ever done. There, it was just so physically and mentally exhausting to go through that cave and pretty muddy, as you can see in the after photo. Um, and I just don't think either of us had any idea what we were, uh, what we could expect going into this. Um, there were some tight spaces, there was a lot of water, and then we had all of this camera equipment that we had to carry around with us and keep that safe. And it was just, it was just incredibly tough. So now, how has cavers thought, uh, the, the way they, ch they think about safety, how has that changed over time? Well, as you can imagine, technology has really made things a lot safer. Just think about light and how much a headlamp really illuminates things so much better than like a candle or a gas lamp. And speaking of technology, we actually had kind of an interesting experience where down in the cave, we ran into somebody that we weren't expecting. Um, and he was testing a technology that he thinks is going to actually help with cave rescue. So this is Trey Hinky. He was crouched on the cave floor with a phone and this little device in his hand called a Gotenna Mesh. And basically, it's a small transmitter that boosts your cell signal so you can get a text message up to the surface. And Hinky reached out to the company that makes this and uh, told them that they were, he was using it underground. And this is what he told us about that. And told them, I'm taking these underground. And everybody's ears just popped. Like, wait a minute, we never thought to do this. So how is this even possible? Let's, let's try it out. How can we help? So they started uh, sending me a couple of units and then uh, been in communication with them ever since, just trying to further the reaches underground. So this technology is still being developed. It was actually made for emergency communications above the ground. Say there's like a natural disaster and all the communication lines are jammed. Um, but people are now using it for lots of situations like try underground, but also people hiking in rural areas, just anywhere where you can't really get a cell phone signal. So how soon can this be used in actual rescues? So this is actually a pretty limited technology right now. For one thing, it's really expensive. It's like $180 for two of these devices, and you need a lot more than that to get enough of a relay to send a text message through all of that rock underground. And Anmar Mirza, the cave rescuer who we heard from in the story, he says they'll definitely test it out. He doesn't think they're gonna replace any of their current rescue systems with that, but it might be a tool that they use in the future. All right, Becca, it looks like a lot of fun. Thank you so much for doing that. You did a great job. Thanks, Joe. Well, George Taliaferro, the first African-American to be chosen in the NFL draft, died this week at age 91. Taliaferro first played football in high school in Gary, Indiana, before leading Indiana University to its first Big Ten championship in 1945. He experienced the full brunt of race, bigotry, and exclusion along the way. Here's some of his story from the WTIU documentary, Indiana Legends. It was absolutely a shock to me to be segregated and discriminated against to the extent that it was in the city of Louisville. George experienced racism on the field, off the field. He experienced racism almost everywhere he went because that was, is what was happening in the country at that time. Indiana University Bloomington was very segregated when George came to school there in 1945. There were restaurants he couldn't go into that were on campus. He couldn't live on campus. He couldn't go to movie theaters on certain days. And it was frustrating for him because they had wanted him to come and play football for them and had actively recruited him to do so. George did encounter some racism when he played for Indiana University on the field. There were teams they played against that just weren't used to playing against, black players. He didn't really let it bother him. He just continued to play football. He went to an all-black school. They didn't have football uniforms. They didn't have the stadium. He couldn't understand those things. So he wanted to demonstrate that despite the differences in physical equipment, that he could achieve. But he wasn't just doing that for himself. He was doing that for his friends, his family, for the entire race. That's what motivated him. He wanted to succeed in a country that told him he should be able to.
And Hoosier is interested in learning how to preserve or rehab an old barn or getting help from Indiana Landmarks. Dozens of people came out for the Indiana Landmarks Barn Again workshop that seeks to educate and inform owners about how to maximize the use of barns built before 1950. They are sort of the icon of our agricultural heritage. Um, they are landmarks on our rural landscape. Uh, we've lost so many. We realize that agriculture has changed, but the barns themselves are adaptable. Indiana offers a 100% property tax deduction for historic barn preservation. That's the end of this program. Our work continues online as we cover the news throughout the week at WTIUnews.org. Have a great weekend. Indiana News Desk is made possible in part by Smithville Fiber, the GigaCity Company, Fiber Internet, HD, and Digital IPTV in Southern Indiana. More information at smithville.com. Mallard Grodner Attorneys, providing legal services to clients and the community. Understanding, expertise, results. Bloomington and Indianapolis, lawmg.com. The IU School of Education, preparing teachers, scholars, and administrators to improve teaching in Indiana and around the world. Education.indiana.edu. IU Alumni Association, connecting IU's network of alumni and sharing the Indiana spirit through scholarships, advocacy, and volunteerism. Alumni.iu.edu. IU Center for Rural Engagement, extending IU Bloomington resources to improve Hoosier lives in partnership with communities and organizations, rural.indiana.edu, and by WTIU members. Thank you.